Welcome, Modern Tactical Shooting. Now, a few months back, the United States Army selected for the NGSW program the SIG XM5 in 6.8 or their .277 Fury as the winner with the plans of replacing every M4, M16 in the Army arsenal with the new SIG XM5 rifle. Now, that was a few months ago. And I think based on recent events, mainly the war in Ukraine, I'm going to say it now, I think the Army is going to slowly pump the brakes on their decision to outfit every fighting MOS, fighting soldier in the Army with the SIG XM5 rifle. And I think this is based on a few factors, so let's get into it right now. Now, before I get into why I think the Army is going to pump the brakes, let me first say I have not shot the SIG XM5 rifle, so I don't have any first-hand experience with it. But looking at some great videos on Task and Purpose and Garand Thumb, uh, you can glean a lot of information about the rifle, its recoil from those videos, and of course, most of the data about the rifle, the weight, length, and all that, you can find online. And it's based on that, I'm going to put some of my criticism about the XM, from XM rifle here in this video. But firstly, let's get into why the Army went with the uh, whole NGSW program in the first place. They wanted overmatch against weapon systems that we were facing in Afghanistan with the plan that if we have overmatch for the future fight, we'll be able to take on an enemy no problem. Their plan for overmatch is greatly misdirected. The overmatch issue is based on the PKM belt-fed machine gun, a favorite weapon of the Taliban and of the enemy. I faced it numerous times in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, the enemy loves to use terrain and distance. They don't like to close with American forces. So it was common that you would be engaged with a PKM from its max effective range around six or 700 yards. And it's true, most of the weapons in a infantry platoon cannot match that distance except for the M240 belt-fed machine gun. And if there are any DMR guys armed with a 7.62 rifle, the old M21 or the M110, but the PKM does outrange the service rifle. But here's where the issue is. We're trying to decide a rifle for overmatch going against a belt-fed machine gun. We already have overmatch with the M4 against the enemy's common weapons, the AK-47 in 762 by 39 and the 545 version. The M16 M4 is more accurate at long range. We have overmatch. It's a misdirection. It's a mistake to try and say, okay, let's give every soldier overmatch with their rifle against belt-fed machine guns. That's how you end up with this SIG XM5 rifle, which when we get into it is close to 13 pounds which will be the heaviest rifle ever issued to uh, service members in the military. Now, if we go back in time to the days of Vietnam, the M14 has the shortest service life of any rifle ever used by the Army. Going into Vietnam, it's, you know, the M14 is a 600 meter rifle easy and 762 by 51 does some awesome damage on the human body. But all these factors were negated by how the Viet Cong fought and the terrain and the weapon systems that the Viet Cong were using. The M14 was too long and too heavy. With one loaded mag, the M14's right around 10 pounds. With the excessive recoil and limited to 20 round magazines, the M14 was completely outclassed by the new at the time AK-47 with its 30 round mags. And the way the Viet Cong fought, get up close to the army platoons, and unleash massive volleys of fire to gain fire superiority, which is a necessity if you want to win a gunfight against soldiers with a heavier rifle uh, with 20 round mags that got to reload more. And again, the awesome range of the M14 was totally negated by the terrain, the jungle at the time, and how the Viet Cong fought. So here we are now in 2022, we're going to choose a rifle that weighs even more than the M14, it is limited to 20 round magazines and yes paired with the xm i believe it's 157 scope by vortex it can do some awesome hits out at range as dem demonstrated by grand thumb but outside of afghanistan uh where is this rifle going to be useful 
Sure, in Afghanistan, I wish I had it uh, back during the hard fighting and parts of sub-Saharan Africa and parts of the Middle East where it's tabletop flat desert. But if we look what's going on in the world right now, the capabilities of the rifle are really not going to come to play with the situation and how firefights are actually going on outside of Afghanistan. If we look what's going on in Ukraine right now, it is full spectrum war. Everything from aircraft, armor engagements, artillery, uh, firefights, of course, with rifles and machine guns, drones being employed. It is a full-blown conflict, full-blown war. And the soldiers that are on the ground, they're clearing trenches, and they're fighting anywhere from uh, point blank in some of these foxhole trench engagements, really out to only about two or 300 yards if you watch a lot of the firefight clips because of the terrain that they're fighting in. It's mostly wooded areas or in urban areas, so there really is no need uh, for a gun that can shoot 600 yards. And most of the fighting going on in Ukraine, you could get by with a simple red dot on your rifle or a simple LPVO. Because again, if you look at the fighting going on, if it's beyond three or 400 yards, uh, they're, they're using artillery, they're using other things to engage troops. It's, it's not really until they close on each other that they're going to the rifle. So armed with the SIG XM5 in that type of scenario, sure, it might be an awesome six to 800 meter gun, but you're never really going to be shooting it at that distance. You're going to be shooting it a lot closer, and in which case our current guns, the M4, uh, the Mark 18, uh, would do just fine in that scenario. Sure, the 6.8 round is going to be a lot more lethal round, but again, you're limited to 20 round magazines. And one thing that is ignored with firefights is how, they, how you actually uh, win a firefight when it's multiple opponents going against each other. Uh, however you, however the firefight starts, uh, whether it's a meeting engagement, you bump into each other, you're out patrolling, uh, we call it movement contact, that's all a lot of them happen in Afghanistan. When you first uh, bump into the enemy or they open up on you, you have to return a large volume of fire to get that fire superiority. Not every shot is a well-aimed one shot, one kill. You're basically laying down lead in the enemy's direction to force them to get down or cease fire so that you can maneuver against them getting close and then kill them with well-aimed shots. There's a great video, I believe it's Ukrainian Special Forces. They're doing just that, they're in a wooded area and you can't see the enemy in it, but I think the enemy is only 100 to 200 yards away and they are laying down suppressive fire and bounding forward to close in on the Russians. Now, can you just imagine uh, being forced to do this with 20 round magazines against the Russians who have 30 round magazines? And I think in the full video clip of this firefight, I believe the guy with the helmet cam that is featured in this, I think he goes through at least three or four magazines during this engagement. And that's three or four 30, uh, 30 round mags. Just imagine the amount of reloading if you have a 20 round uh, magazine for your rifle. So that is the first issue I have with the SIG XM5 is the limited magazine capacity. I think going to a 20 round magazine is a step backwards. Yes, the new 6.8 round is lighter than 7.62 by 51. I hear it's lighter than the old 6.0 SPC, but it's still heavier than 5.56. And the data that I've seen is basically five mags of 6.8 weighs the same as seven mags of 5.56. Seven mags of 5.56, you have 210 rounds as a basic load, Whereas five rounds of 6.8 and 20 round mags, you have 100 rounds. Or even if you go to six or seven mags, you still only have 140 rounds on you. And now also with six or seven mags, your basic load is heavier than 5.56. So touting the 6.8 cartridge is lighter ammo. You can carry more of it. True, but that's only true against legacy systems running 762 by 51. Against the M4, it's still outclassed in terms of magazine capacity and ammunition weight. So that's the first strike against the 6.8 rifle I see. And currently, the Army's intent is to pair the SIG rifle with Vortex's XM157 scope, which again, Grantham demonstrates that it's a pretty awesome long-range scope. But again, this capability is not going to mean much if your average firefight is under 300 yards, under 300 meters. And if we go back in time, go back to the early days in Iraq when the Marines were doing all that hard fighting, 
uh, in Fallujah. I mean, everything was CQB urban distance. Uh, if we look at more recent events like the French in Mali, uh, even though Mali uh, might be kind of a desert country, the fighting's going on in urban areas, again, well under 300 yards. If you look at the uh, Filipino uh, commandos, Filipino army taking on the insurrectionists in Marawi, if, I don't know how to pronounce it right, that's as close as I can get. Again, they're fighting strictly in an urban area and everything's well under that 300 meter mark. Uh, again, CQB, close quarter combat distance. So that XM157 Vortex scope is not really going to offer a capability that you'll be able to utilize. Uh, you'll be able to get by with a red dot. And honestly, if, if I was dropping into a uh, scenario where I know everything is going to be under 300 yards and I'm going to be in an urban area, uh, a red dot is a great option or a simple LPVO because the that XM157 scope by Vortex, they still have not released what the actual weight is. The latest video by Vortex Basically, they just say it's less than what the current market offers with regards to an LPVO and a laser rangefinder on the rifle. So sure, I totally believe that Vortex scope is lighter than a LPVO and a laser rangefinder. That's two different systems. But, uh, you know, it's got to be at least over a pound. Uh, I bet you easily it's over a pound. So that's still a pretty heavy optic. Real quick, I'm happy to announce I partnered with Slate Black Industries. That means you get a discount code down in the description if you're looking to order some of their M-Lock rail covers and different foregrips. And I, of course, get some free stuff that I get to mount up on my rifles. So it's a win-win for all of us. You can go ahead and check them out at slateblackindustries.com. Now, I have talked about the need to take long-range shots in urban combat, uh, specifically in my setting up your rifle based on the mission is wrong video. Uh, I've seen it, and I know plenty of Special Forces soldiers have had to take uh, long-range shots in the urban fight. They have to fight their way to the objective, on the objective, and off the objective. But when I say long-range in an urban fight, that's three or 400 yards, or three or 400 meters. Uh, sure, that XM157 scope is going to make hitting targets at 300 yards really uh, smooth, but is it worth that weight? And that gets into the overall weight of the rifle. Now, according to the SIG website, that rifle with an empty magazine is 8.3 pounds. Again, that Vortex scope has to be at least a pound. Uh, if we compare that to uh, the rifle I carried in Afghanistan my last tour, this is a clone of that rifle, 14 and a half inch barreled M4. I did use this very same VCOG scope down range, has an offset red dot. And when I was using it in Afghanistan, I had it with a Surefire SOCOM suppressor and an LE5 IR laser, 30 round magazine. This gun was just over 11 pounds. And let me tell you on a multi-day operation, this setup got old really fast. And that is one reason why the Mark 18 with that shorty barrel is, or was a super popular, super popular setup for Afghanistan. Paired with that Surefire SOCOM suppressor, it was just better balanced and a little bit lighter than carrying your full-length barreled M4, and that's why a lot of SF guys ran it, even though it wasn't the best rifle for distance. But again, the length and weight of this with all that stuff on there, uh, just over 11 pounds. So when you look at that SIG rifle, 8.3 pounds with an unloaded mag, so it's really probably just over 8.5 pounds with a loaded magazine. That Vortex Optic's got to be at least a pound. And no matter what SIG suppressor they put on that rifle, it's supposed to come with a suppressor. All their suppressors are just under or just over a pound. And then you add on a white light, which you're going to need in combat, and an IR laser. That's where I'm getting that rifle's got to be close to 13 pounds, fully loaded out. And again, that's, that's heavier than the M14 we used in Vietnam. Sure, it's lighter than the Mark 17, that 762 SCAR we used in Afghanistan. That gun with a loaded magazine is right around nine pounds. Throw in a suppressor and an optic. Sure, the SIG XM5 is going to be lighter than that. But is it going to be the right gun to give the average soldier in the military say, hey, here's this 12 to 13 pound rifle? I don't think that's the right answer.
Now let me go back to the Army's reason for this rifle and this caliber, and that is to have overmatch against enemy weapon systems, basically being able to outrange the enemy's weapon system. It's flawed because, again, I think we're basing it on rifle against belt-fed machine gun, and really that's totally misdirected to what the real, real problem is. The real problem, I think, is how we're arming our units starting at the squad and platoon level. It's called MTONE, Modified Table uh, of organiz Organization and Equipment. Basically, how are our platoons armed and it starts from there. An infantry platoon is made up of four squads. Three of the squads are broken down into two different fire teams. It's a nine-man squad. In these squads, two of the members are carrying the squad automatic weapon, the M249 saw, a belt-fed 5.56 light machine gun. The rest all have M4s, M16s with some grenade launchers. And only one squad in the platoon is the weapon squad, where it's outfitted with two M240 machine guns. This has not changed since when I was in the infantry back in the 1990s. When I left the infantry to go special forces in 1998, it was the same MTONE based off of the Cold War and really based off of theory. Again, the three squads that were broken into two fire teams, we had the squad automatic weapon was the, the biggest weapon system we had in the squad and only two belt fed machine guns. And there's the flaw. This has never been updated the entire time we were fighting in Afghanistan. So when you only have two M240 machine guns in a 30-man platoon, if you get shot at by anything more than two PKM machine guns when you're going against the enemy, then of course you don't have overmatch because that five, uh, that 5.56 M249 squad automatic weapon past 400 yards, that light machine gun, basically 5.56, the trajectory is of a water hose and it can't compete against a real belt-fed machine gun, the PKM. The solution is not to give everybody a 13-pound rifle in 6.8. I think the proper solution we should have done early on in the war in Afghanistan is gone to a better squad automatic weapon for the infantry squads. We have the Mark 48 in inventory. It's basically a 7.62 squad automatic weapon. It's just a little bit bigger than the M249, the same controls, so you want to have to relearn it. Or do what some of our uh, partner uh, countries have done like the French, I believe they permanently added 7.62 rifles to their squads in England. They have it too. Sure, we have DMR designated uh, marksmanship riflemen. Uh, we give them a 7.62 M21 or the M110, but that's not one per squad. It's maybe two per platoon. If we had just looked at our MTO and E in the beginning and properly modified it to the threat, we wouldn't have the overmatch problem to begin with. We could have solved it with weapon systems we already had in the inventory and allowed riflemen to keep carrying their lighter and handier uh, M16s and M4s. You don't hear about an overmatch problem within special forces. That's because a special forces 12-man A team has always been outfitted, outfitted better than your army platoon. For instance, my last tour in Afghanistan, we'd roll outside the wire with 12 to 14 men. We had on hand two to, two to four Mark 17 SCARs and 7.62. We had Mark 48s on hand. We had M240 machine guns. And we utilized heavily the 60 millimeter mortar in handheld mode. And all that is when we're out dismounted. If we had vehicles with us, our RGs or MATVs, we could bring mini guns to bear on the enemy, uh, automatic grenade launchers. So if we got into a firefight, we had a lot better weapon systems already on hand. We didn't have an overmatch issue. And I brought this up in an article I wrote a long time ago for DefenseReview.com, my competition to combat crossover series of articles. In part two, I got slammed for saying this in a lot of internet gun forums, but your rifle really is a PDW. Sure, we call it an assault rifle. It's picked up that term, but this is a personal defense weapon. This is what you use when you first run into the enemy to return fire with and hopefully kill. But this is a 500 meter gun and it's a rifle and we primarily shoot it in semi-auto. There are better weapon systems to utilize when you get into a firefight. This is just what you return fire with immediately while you call in and bring up your better assets. And that's what we did on the ground in Afghanistan. 
If I got shot at by a PKM, yes, I would return fire with my M4 and do the best I could. But at the same time, I was calling in on the radio for team members who had the Mark 40, Mark 48 belt fed machine gun to come on up and return fire. Or I was calling up the trucks with the mini guns or we're breaking out the 60 millimeter mortar in handheld mode or firing 84 millimeter Carl Gustav rockets at that machine gun position. This is just what I used immediately on hand. And then as the fight progresses, you bring the proper weapons to bear against the enemy. How you win gunfights is you have more guys returning fire on the enemy or you bring bigger and better guns into the fight. You don't wanna be evenly matched against the enemy, why? So this is a PDW. Uh, it shines obviously when you're up close doing CQB, urban fighting and things like that. When you're going against machine guns and long range threats shooting at you, you bring in your long range, bigger and better guns to go against them. Uh, the answer again is not to arm everybody, I think with a 13 pound rifle, that's gonna weigh everybody down. And again, you're gonna give them 20 round mags and a reduced basic load so you have less ammo on you to utilize in a firefight. Uh, one of the heaviest fights I was in my last tour, I went through four mags, four 30 round mags. So if I had the 6.8 and I fired the same amount of ammo, I would have been out of ammo halfway through the firefight. Again, I don't think it's the answer. Now the Army is also adopting the SIG LMG machine gun in 6.8. And in a perfect world, if I had, if I was in charge, what I would do is I would get rid of both M249s at the squad level. And I would replace one with the SIG LMG in 6.8. And then the other SAR gunner, he would have the SIG XM5 rifle. That would give you two 6.8 guns in a squad. And that would, I believe, solve the overmatch issue. And you'd still only have two calibers in a platoon. Right now, a platoon has 5.56 in the rifles and the saws and 7.62 in the M240 machine gun. So if we replaced half the saws with the LMG, replaced the 240s with that LMG, that would up the firepower of the platoon level. And we would solve the overmatch issue without having to burden every rifleman in a platoon with a 12 to 13 pound rifle. So there it is, my thoughts on the SIG XM5 rifle in 6.8. But honestly, it really doesn't matter. It's just my opinion. I'm a retired SF guy. What do I know now? I'm out of the army. Uh, so what I think and say really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. But looking at what's been going on the last year almost now in Ukraine and the type of fighting we are seeing, I think there's a good chance the Army is relooking really the idea of a mass rollout, replacing the M4 and 5.56 with this new rifle. I think we're only going to see a limited rollout. If I'm wrong and the Army does do a complete rollout as they initially intended and replace the M4 and 5.56 in mass, I'm gonna say it now, I don't think we're gonna see it last more than five years. I think the weight of the rifle, the limited 20 round mags, the limited basic load, it's gonna be less than what you can carry in 5.56 and that increased recoil. I think it'll be too much for the average soldier and the weapon system won't be right for a lot of the other theaters of war we could find ourselves in. But again, what do I know? I could be completely wrong and the soldiers could love it and it could be a great success. But based on my 26 years experience and what I've seen in combat, I don't think I'm going to be too far off the mark on this one. Now, I'm not alone in my criticism of the 6.8 rifle by SIG, that XM5. If you head over to Practical Accuracy, he has a great video where basically he's making the same argument about the weight, the recoil, other aspects of the gun that would make it an awesome Afghanistan rifle but basing your next generation of rifle on a theater of war that you don't see anywhere else in the world, uh, those super long ranges where we're fighting against the enemy and trying to say that is the standard, he puts out a good argument why that is wrong also. So I'm gonna put a link to that down in the description. But, uh, but as always, hope you found this video entertaining and informative. Again, it's just my opinion, what do I know? But again, I don't think I'm gonna be that far off the mark with my belief in that the rifle is going to maybe not be rolled out in such a mass way that the Army first announced. But as always, I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching.